Hello, everyone. Welcome to Reimagining Education, conversations on character, commitment, and community. For those of you joining us for the first time today, this series is part of the Virtues and Vocations Initiative here at Duke University, which seeks to make character, purpose, and meaning central to education and pre-professional and professional education in particular. My name is Suzanne Shanahan, and I direct the Keenan Institute for Ethics, the institutional home for this initiative and this series. Quick note about logistics. Please feel free to submit questions through the Q&A throughout the conversation. And after about 40 minutes, they will be passed on to me to pose to today's conversation partner. Please also note that we try to address as many questions as possible, though not always able to address them all. Uh, please finally note that there are lots of folks working behind the scenes. So if we have any typical Zoom troubles, they will swiftly jump in and address them. And with that, I am thrilled to bits to be uh, introducing today's final speaker of this 12 part series today on the anniversary of George George Floyd's death, Duke's very own Dr. Nikki Washington on why computer science should care about identity. Dr. Washington is a professor of the practice of computer science here at Duke and author of Unapologetically Dope, Lessons for Black Women and Girls on Surviving and Thriving in the Tech Field. A Durham native and daughter of a retired computer science programmer and K-12 administrator, Nikki Washington was exposed to computer science at a very early age, including programming in BASIC and Pascal before high school. Raised with an entire community of black engineers supporting her, she never realized how unique her pursuit of computer science actually was until she attended Johnson C. Smith University. Her PhD in computer science from North Carolina State made her the very first black woman at the university to earn a degree in computer science. She is a 2019 computer science hall of fame inductee. Her career in higher education began at Howard University as the first black female member in the department of computer science, but she has also worked at Winthrop University, the Aerospace Corporation and IBM. We are very fortunate she has landed here with us and welcome Nikki. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, for having me. I really appreciate it. So um, it's delightful to have you here today. And I'm hoping as always, we can do three things in the conversation. First, just hear about uh, your work and how you arrived at it, uh, sort of what your mission in this work actually is. Uh, consider a little bit how this past year may have shaped, reshaped, or amplified uh, what you're trying to achieve. And then if we could take a step back and maybe you could advise us on things we should be doing as higher education educators. So that's sort of the overall game plan. Um, so with that, let's just jump right in. And I would love you to share a bit of your own story and how you came to uh, this framing I saw in a November 2020 webinar um, described as my work is my protest, perhaps giving us also a glimpse into unapologetically dope and your 3C program. And so feel free to take it anywhere in that space that you'd like. Sure, so um, I think it, my work being my protest has been uh, a long time coming for me. I think it's a culmination of all of the events that I've experienced from my childhood through present day. Um, I talk very candidly about my experiences uh, being a black girl turned black woman in STEM, specifically computing, moving in spaces where there were one or maybe a couple of people who look like me having to fight being othered and marginalized in so many ways, except for uh, small pockets of time. So growing up in Durham, I'd say, is a really unique experience for me at the time. D Durham has a rich history of Black excellence from the Haytai community, which is one of the original Black Wall Streets. Um, so being raised here, I grew up around a lot of uh, other Black kids 
whose parents were engineers and attorneys and educators. And uh, they were mostly graduates of historically black colleges and universities. So for me, I always understood uh, how important it was to thrive in your fields, uh, whatever endeavors you chose to do. Uh, my parents, as well as my friend's parents told us that our only limits were ourselves. So uh, it made it very easy for us to put blinders on, to focus on competing with each other and not looking at anyone else. However, there were these instances where I always felt othered. Um, one that I talk about very candidly is kind of the first time I experienced racism or remember experiencing it as a child and being 12 years old in my sixth grade math class and having my teacher at the time, who was a white woman, uh, very adamantly telling us that Black History Month is racist. In the middle of Black History Month, um, she's extremely upset about this and tells us all that if we have Black History Month, then we should have White History Month. And so me being the only student who raised my hand and said, well, that doesn't make sense because we already study white history all of the other 11 months. So why is this such a thing? And being told directly by her that it's people like you who give blacks a bad rep. And I didn't understand exactly the weight that she put on me at that time. I knew what she told me was wrong. I knew how it made me feel in that moment and how embarrassed and small I felt. Uh, but it wasn't until uh, I accidentally told my mom, and I say accidentally because uh, and, and one of the things that I joke about in the book is that, you know, growing up with a Black mother, that if they have to come to the school for a reason, then it better not be something that you did. But the way that it was presented to me, it was made as if I did this to myself. And so I did not tell her until a couple of days later. And when she found out, uh, the conversations that were had between her and my dad on how to handle this, uh, how to then schedule a meeting with the principal and the teacher and being called to the office and walking in and seeing my mother, the principal who at the time was a black man and this woman sitting there and this woman crying and saying that she did not mean to hurt me, that she didn't mean what she said. She's not racist and she's sorry. It was for me, I tell people a couple of things. It was the first time I had to deal with racism. It was also the first time I had to deal with white women's tears. And I knew that both of those things would be something that I'd have to experience a lot more during my lifetime. And that proved true. So uh, I moved through to high school. Uh, I'm a product of Durham Public Schools here. And uh, at the time I was attending Jordan, it was uh, pretty balanced, but it was still predominantly white at the time. And I was in a lot of honors and AP courses and teachers did not know how to handle someone like me. And when I say handle, that's probably the, a bad word, but how to engage with a student like me. Uh, a student who is very opinionated, who is very assertive um, and also is very smart and very intelligent. And it became, I was almost a threat a lot of times. And my mother spent a lot of time in the principal's office or at the school, right? Because my, my father was a K-12 educator and administrator as well. So he couldn't always come to the meeting. So a lot of times she had to balance that. Um, and I, I remember her telling me a lot of times, like, I have never been so happy for you to finish high school and get out of Durham public schools because it was just a fight from sixth grade to 12th grade of being seen and recognized and valued. And for people to understand that because I show up differently than maybe a white female or an Asian female or a white male, that that doesn't mean that I'm any less intelligent. It doesn't mean that my experiences and what I'm saying are any less valid. It just means that you need to recognize and appreciate what I bring to the table. So for me, the first time that I really felt like I was in an environment that was similar to home, and when I say home, I mean my internal home, was when I attended Johnson C. Smith University. Um, attending a black college was very important for me. Uh, I did not wanna fight anymore as an undergrad. I spent X number of years as a K-12 student doing that. And so while all of my teachers, especially one of my favorite teachers, uh, Hollis Self, uh, I remember I was so excited telling her all of these schools I, I was accepted to. And I called out FAMU and a and and uh, Smith, but I called Johnson C. Smith, Smith and she and Hampton. And she thought I meant Smith College. So the only school that she lit up for in that list was, oh, Nikki, you know, um, 
Smith College, that's a great school. You know, you'll love it. And I said, no, 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 Johnson C. Smith in Charlotte. And her entire face changed. And it was almost like she pitied me of, oh, you need to go to a good school, Nikki. You know, you need to go to Duke or Harvard or, or Princeton or something like that. And I remember being so emphatic and, and upset and blurting out, I don't want to go to a white school. And she couldn't understand why in the world a smart Black girl would want to attend a Black college. Because in her eyes, attending a Black school meant that you couldn't get into a Duke or Harvard, et cetera. For me, it was very much, I want to go somewhere where all I have to worry about is the work. I'm tired of fighting. And I had one of the best experiences of my life at um, Johnson C. Smith. And so if I fast forward then, attending NC State, I tell people a lot of times it's high, high school 2.0, because in graduate school, I was one of two Black women who were in the PhD program. We were the only Black people going through the PhD program at the time. And so uh, there was a lot of marginalization there for me, again, not only from professors, but again, classmates who didn't want to work with me because they didn't think I knew anything. And so um, professors didn't as well. Uh, I was very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Harry Peros, who was my advisor, uh, work with me. And we built a great relationship to this day uh, where we learn from each other a lot of times. And um, from there, I went to work with the Aerospace Corporation, but only for a year because again, I was facing marginalization and I really hated the fact that I spent all of this time in school. I'm showing up to work every day uh, in this space where in order to work at the Aerospace Corporation on the technical staff, you had to have a minimum of a master's degree. Well, I was the only woman in my department and the only black person in the DC arm who had a PhD in our division. And so that became problematic a lot of times where I have to, again, deal with insecurities from people, particularly white women, who felt certain ways about the fact that I'm showing up and getting access to opportunities and they're not. And I, I often remember and tell people that I was the most comfortable with the, the people who worked in the staff. So the security guards or the custodians because they were the only other black faces that I saw. And I knew that again, this wasn't for me. It, it felt like high school 3.0 at this point. And so there was an opportunity to teach at Howard. Uh, first as an adjunct, they were looking for a full-time position, but I was so miserable at my job. And when my uh, manager, when I asked him why we don't recruit at Howard for uh, graduate students, he told me, well, Howard's not as reputable as the Virginia Techs and the North Carolina States and UVAs. And so that to me was a turning point again, uh, where I decided that I would not be somewhere where uh, people who graduated from HBCUs like me are not given a uh, fair shot. And so I left there, chose to work at Howard. And again, I'm in an environment where just like with Johnson C. Smith, it's another HBCU. That for me was the one point, again, as an adult, where I felt like I only had to focus on the work. I didn't have to worry about being othered again because I am in an environment where everyone looks like me. But I left Howard in 2015 after losing my father and to be closer to my mom and the rest of my family. And so a lot of what happens for me now in my research was uh, motivated by the last five years that I spent at Winthrop. And I've been very vocal about my experience there. I was not the only black woman in the department, but a lot of times I felt like I was because I was showing up and I was being othered and no one was fighting for me. Um, I dealt with a lot of issues, not only in my department, but also in the college because uh, at the university, we were an ABET accredited computer science department, but we sat in an AACSB accredited college of business. So there's already this disconnect between people in the business departments or business related departments who don't understand what computer science does. Everyone just assumed we were IT. But then there's also this disconnect because you're in the South. Um, and people are not used to someone showing up and having the audacity to bring their most full and whole self to the table every day. So there were students who did not appreciate uh, the fact that I was confident and assertive and that I was not as submissive as they might uh, prefer. And so there were complaints that would happen to uh, the chair. They would show up in my course evaluation. She's rude. She's disrespectful. She has no gratitude. All of these things that uh, have been proven time and time again to be biased, especially to women, even more to women of color, but especially for Black women. 
And so I started to try to figure out how do how do I handle all of these situations when the comments always came back to me as if I should be the one to solve the problem and I should fix myself in order to get better teaching evaluations. Um, the final kind of watershed moments for me were um, when I decided to apply for full professor. Uh, and my first application was denied. It was denied because of a subset of biased student evaluations, these same evaluations. Um, and, I, and the entire process was biased, uh, but also the comments that I received were biased. And I remember sitting in the office, the dean's office with my chair, and uh, even how I found out was uh, problematic because the only reason I found out that my promotion was denied was because I saw an email that went out to the entire college congratulating another person for being promoted to associate. And so when I showed up and I'm in California at the time checking emails and the next morning I'm on a flight early morning back to Charlotte and immediately landed and drove to my dean's office to listen to uh, my dean and my chair tell me that uh, you need to find some people that you know who can help you become a better teacher. And I took a moment back and I literally cussed in the meeting and said, I'm not doing that. And I'm not doing that because this is not about me. This is about biased evaluations that no one seems to want to acknowledge here. And the comments kept coming back. Well, you know, I'm a brown person. I don't, I have these same course expectations. I don't have these issues, Nikki. And I kept saying, but for the second time since you've been here, let me remind you, you're not black. You're not a woman. You're not a black woman. And your experience as an Indian man in higher education is not gonna equate to mine as a black woman in South Carolina. And so uh, it, it just became this tit for tat of how do we get students to like you? What can we do? And I kept saying, if you are expecting me to change who I am to be liked by students, then I promise you I will not be here much longer. So that was 2018-2019 uh, academic year. But if we fast forward, I was convinced and kind of voluntold uh, by the provost, the new provost, to please apply again. Well, we knew that there were all of these issues, Nikki, we'd like for you to just get a fair look. And I remember sitting in our office and telling her that you're asking once again, a black woman to become the sacrificial lamb to prove a point here. When I already know what will happen, but I'm going to do this. And I want you to remember this conversation because when it happens again, it's going to be a problem. I went through the same process again with the exact same application and it was denied now for different reasons. And it became a point where I knew that nothing I said and did was going to matter uh, because there were people in place in positions of privilege and power who were working specifically to make sure that I did not succeed past a certain level that they thought I deserved to succeed. And so uh, my work became how do I address this in a way that gets around these people? Because the problem as I saw it was one, my colleagues, but two, the students and how they viewed me. And if I could get students to understand that I don't have the luxury of being called by my first name when I'm in class. You can do that to Joe Schmo over here because Joe is a white man. And so that level of comfort does not take away from his privilege and power dynamic. But as a black woman, how do I get students to understand that for the longest time historically in this country, black people period uh, were always called by their first name, boy, girl, or worse. And so as a uh, Reconstruction happened, post-civil rights movement, there was always this intention behind refusing to give Black people a specific deference. So when you ask, when you refer to someone, I, I can't, I don't have the luxury of call, being called Mickey. I need to be called Professor or Dr. Washington because otherwise I'm never going to get the respect and there's never going to be a level of authority in place. But people saw that as she's rude. She's disrespectful. And as I write ab about it a lot of times, she's uppity. And that's the word that often goes with uh, Black people in these spaces, especially in higher ed. So that was kind of the beginning of all of this. So I started to think through how do I create um, 
material that can teach students this kind of information better. Because I have knowledge that's based on my lived experiences of Black women, but these other students don't. And can I pull more? Because I know that my lived experience still doesn't give language to everything that I've experienced. So that's when I started to pour more into social science and try to understand um, specifically more about identity as it relates to race, ethnicity, gender, class, ability. How do I then assemble this in a way that it can be packaged to teach students and build their cultural competence? I didn't even really know what cultural competence meant until probably 2016 when I started going through all of these things and was trying to figure out how to uh, give expert language to what I was experiencing. And so from there, that became the birth of first the race, gender, class, and computing course, because that was supposed to have been implemented at my prior institution in the fall of 2020. And then fortunately, I um, was able to take the position at Duke. Um, and from there, what really triggered all of this became uh, the murder of George Floyd, right? Because before that, it was just my work. This was kind of my protest of um, bucking the system and raging against the machine, I'll say. but. The problem was it wasn't really gonna be global and scaled. I wasn't even thinking of it in terms of how to change this entire community. I was simply trying to figure out how to save myself from a terrible situation. But then the murder of George Floyd came and um, there was so many things, organizations, institutions, scrambling to try to figure out how to address racism and white supremacy uh, at their organizations. Um, I'm very fortunate to have been transitioning at that time to Duke over the summer. And so the course was something that I was planning to teach in the spring semester, but because of everything that happened, I received a lot of feedback from colleagues. Like, I really think you might wanna think about teaching this course in the fall. So all of this work kind of came about and really took off because of that unfortunate sequence of events one year ago today. Uh, people started to learn about my work because I think the week after or the week of George Floyd's murder, there was a uh, conversation going on a computer science listserv for uh, computer science education. And there was a, a quote that we should really think more about supporting our black colleagues and students. It was from a white woman and it was kind of a charge to the community that we really need to do a better job. And I remember there was an email response that came back from a white man that censored himself and was basically, well, I just think it's funny that everyone now wants to support uh, everyone here. But when I wrote an article about X, Y, and Z, which had nothing to do with race or gender or anything else identity related, no one responded to my article. And I was livid. I was so angry because this was the same, it was days after all of this happened. And I remember responding, how dare you censor yourself in the middle of all of this? per usual. And that was the first email where people started to learn about the work I was doing on a much broader scale. And people started reaching out saying, hey, do you mind sharing your um, syllabus and curriculum with us? And I kept saying no. And I would say no, because one, I'd done all of this work to assemble all of this information. I'd listened to ton out code switch episodes, seen on radio. There were things that I just remember growing up, like eyes on the prize that I was pulling in. And so I said, there's so much that I had to study and learn myself that uh, I'm not just going to give this to anyone. But then there was also the issue of it's such a fluid topic that there wasn't any curriculum to give. So you had to kind of be immersed in it yourself in order to be effective as an educator. So that kind of birthed the um, idea for the Cultural Competence in Computing Fellows Program or 3C Fellows as it's called. So that kind of became my way of saying, okay, now I can think about this in a broader scale. How is this gonna grow past me and across computing in general? Because these are issues that everyone is facing. Um, so that kind of led me to where I say my work is my protest. I think like a lot of times we've seen um, just even from elections and from over years, the social justice movement, uh, when you look at Black women, uh, they often are considered these pioneers in certain ways or they're doing something that's considered groundbreaking. And in our mind, it really was never considered groundbreaking because all we were simply trying to do was save ourselves. And that's, that's where I am. Wow, that's wonderful. Um, just a couple of questions to pull out some themes here. Um, sort of one of the, the 
phrases you used early on is white women's tears. Can you, can you give another example of that? Because I think that's just a super powerful framing of, of that early moment, but also clearly other moments you've had. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Um, so I, I can give a couple. Uh, there was an incident at Winthrop, I remember, um, in one of my intro classes. And I had a young woman who, uh, I thought she was a really great student. Um, she was non-traditional, a little bit older, former military. Um, and, you know, I always would engage her to, you know, because one of my things was always trying to get students up and participating. And I remember one time there was a student who uh, came into class late. And I remember um, I, I told him, well, you're late. And I stopped class and said, well, you're late. And he's like, oh, remember I emailed you. And I said, oh yeah, you're right. I'm sorry, come on in. And then I kept going with the entire uh, lesson. And then I returned the test and she came to my office right after I returned the exam and she was just pissed. And she plopped down and I'm like, hey, how are you doing? I'm fine. And it was, uh, well, you took up all of these points on this test part and this piece. And I don't think that that was right. And I tried to explain, well, you know, this is how I grade, this is how it works. And she was so defensive about everything. And then it became this, it shifted when she couldn't win that argument to, well, I just thought it was extremely rude on how you approached this student who came to class late. And I said, well, that student didn't have a problem with it. I apologized in the middle of class for forgetting that he contacted me. So what is your issue? Well, I just think it was rude how you spoke to him. And I just think it was a problem and da, 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 da. And I said, so again, are you here to fight someone else's battles that are not yours, even though he doesn't have a problem with it? And then it became, well, I just feel like you don't take time to know students. And then she broke down crying. And I'm sitting there at my desk thinking, well, what are you crying for? Because you're the one that came in here offended, trying to fight everyone else's battles. And when it didn't work out for you, then all of a sudden there are these tears that come. And now it's, you don't take time to get to know me like my other professors do. And I said, if you want to make yourself known, then you can show up in office hours like, like other students do. I'm appalled that you're coming to my office and hurling out all of these accusations and insults, especially when I considered you one of the stronger students and always kind of try to engage with you in class. But clearly that's not enough for you. And so she talks about this whole thing about having kids and you know all of these things that don't matter. And I couldn't understand, well, why, why are we in this space? So I thought that it had finally been resolved. And then something happened a couple of weeks later where she didn't like something that happened. And she responded in an email and CC'd the chair and called herself calling me out. And when I responded back with documentation that she was blatantly wrong and how uh, she had gone out of her way to again, try to attack my credibility as a professional, as I'm walking out of my office, she comes running up again and she's crying again in tears. And I just wanna say, I'm so sorry. And I just, and I had to stop her and say, stop, I, I'm tired of your tears at this point. These are crocodile tears. And what's happening is when you don't get your way because you think that you are the person in charge, then the tears start flowing. And that continued for about two more times through that semester. But these were the kinds of situations where students were providing these uh, course evaluations for me. And they would be able to provide qualitative feedback as well. Um, there's also an issue with a colleague who uh, I remember at a, a back to school event, I'd, uh, I'd never met her husband before, but I'd met her daughters. It just so happened that her husband was black. And so he's sitting with her daughters and I just said, oh, is that your husband? Yeah, you know, okay. Well, we're the... Um, we're kind of like the odd men out here. And I just look like, okay. And then she says, well, you know how that is, Nikki, right? And I said, excuse me? And we stopped, but I chose to document that because it was a university event and meet with the Dean regarding that. And so when we showed up at the meeting and now she's being presented with this, she one, didn't remember what happened, but two, then it became an issue of, um, you know, how I have to show up and you don't know what it's like to be in a, a store and people ask if my daughters are with me or, you know, that other things have happened in my family. And I can say, well, my, your family dysfunction is not my business, but I do know what it's like to be in a store and be questioned. So, uh, and again, there became this point of tears. And I feel like there's always these uh, instances and we've seen it so many times. So it's not really a feeling, 
but there's documentation of how women have weaponized whiteness, right? So as, as we're talking about even the murder of George Floyd on today, the thing that I always like to remind people of is that George Floyd's murder was not the main news story on May 25th, 2020. The big story, we didn't learn about George Floyd's murder until late at, late at night, because I remember tweeting uh, about Christian Cooper. That was the news story of the day was Amy Cooper and Central Park and what she'd done to Christ Christian Cooper and how we saw how she instantly weaponized her whiteness against him by trying to call the police on him and how that backfired on her. And so for me, I remember getting through that night and tweeting, thank God we know Amy Cooper's name and not that man's name. And I said that man because I couldn't remember his name at the time, but I was just grateful that he was still alive. And then I woke up that next morning only to learn about the murder of George Floyd. And it was kind of like, you know, for the one step you take, there were four steps that come back. And so that, that is kind of the personification and the full circle of white women's tears and how they are continuously used against Black people, and not just Black people, but especially Black people um, from past to present. Great. It, um, how has your experience perhaps been different because of your engagement with the tech world, right? So, um, being a black woman in computer science is is that a right how does that create additive more complex challenges um, from your experience and the experience of other black women in similar spaces so i'd say that our experiences as black women in computing are very similar to our experiences as Black women in every other part of society. Um, it's amplified because I think the tech space has refused for a long time to acknowledge the uh, biases that were even present in the technology. I think we just now come around over the last year to the fact that tech is not neutral finally. But people have not been willing to acknowledge that the people developing the technologies are not neutral either. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw does around intersectionality. And there's a lot of work being done by black women scholars like uh, Jakita Owens and Yolanda Rankin around intersectionality in computing as well. Uh, the difference, it, it's kind of that same script, different cast and a different setting and locale. Um, you, you constantly face this sense of being marginalized in so many ways. Um, you always feel like you're one of the only, even if you're not, um, you constantly have no resources and uh, support systems. And I, I talk about and reference here, Dr. Timnit Gabriel and what happened to her in December. So if you think back, Google, for example, made a ton of pledges and commitments in June, like a lot of other tech companies, to uh, be becoming more uh, inclusive, addressing issues of racial injustice, et cetera. Well, then we found out that Dr. Timnit Gabriel was fired on her Christmas vacation over the holidays. Um, she was fired because she was speaking out and complaining about some of these things. And by the way, she's also uh, talking about the fact that a, some of the work that Google does in ethical AI is not the most ethical. Now you brought her in as the leading ethical AI researcher and then you fire her for not conforming to the fact of not calling out how problematic some of the technologies that even you're creating are. But then we look at um, April Christina Curley. So then we find out that around September, while we're still getting this lip service from a lot of tech companies that she was also fired from Google. And it's not just Google, right? There's all of these other companies where we've seen these issues. Um, Basecamp is having their uh, issues right now with the CEO telling people don't bring politics to work. Slack had their issues around the January 6th insurrection. There are all of these companies Pinterest, for example, is a prime example where two Black women were the whistleblowers and called out racism and sexism that they were experiencing, basically misogynoir, and they received a small pennies settlement. But then a white woman uh, comes behind them and claims gender discrimination, and she gets a settlement for tens of millions of dollars. And it's, it's more of the same where success is built on the backs of Black bodies 
and yet we never see the benefit of it. We never see the benefit of the work that we put in, but someone else always gets to come in behind us and benefit from it in ways that we never will. So um, can you connect this, this train of thought back to your 3C fellowship program? Um, and uh, you know, I'm taken by your articulation that we need to start with faculty um, in that program and, and how you think that work in cultural competence will begin to shift that problem in society of success of others built on black bodies. Yeah, so, um, so my issue, as I saw it from my positionality, as well as um, as a student and faculty member was that we can continue to focus on K-12 education and pushing students into CS through all of these different programs that expose students to computer science, but the minute that they hit a college campus, all of that is out the window when the faculty member that they're in front of uh, refuses to acknowledge that my experience is different from yours. Some of my classmates are going to ask me, am I only here because of affirmative action? Uh, someone else is going to say that I'm rude and that I'm intimidating. And so now I'm pushed out because of things that have nothing to do with my actual technical abilities and everything to do with the ways in which people are marginalizing me. So I thought we have to focus on the faculty because you have one or two faculty, hopefully, who get it at an institution. And that's a hope, right? But how many people are doing something? Because again, in computing, we're taught algorithms, complexity, networking, things like, we are not taught social science. So if you don't have the luxury like myself of attending a liberal arts institution and taking additional classes or attending an HBCU, then you don't get necessarily all of these uh, other exposures that are needed to things around class, race, religion, sexuality. So I was uh, under the assumption that it will never work. If it's only a me in place, then that's never gonna work because I'm one person. And when that student gets out of my class, they still have to go through X number of other faculty. And the way that we change the students is we have to first impact the faculty as well because they're the ones teaching the student. So I, um, as I built out the 3C program, I first thought through who all should be there. Um, and I'm very fortunate that at the time I was thinking all of this through, I was transitioning to Duke, like I said, and Cicely Sadler, who uh, just finished her master's here in ECE, uh, asked to work with me on an independent study project. And then I reached out to uh, Shawnee Daly in ECE to see if she also wanted to partner on this. So the three of us became uh, started to come up with who would we target? Why would we target them? What would this program look like? And we knew that it couldn't be a one and done. Right? Because every time we see that something happens in the news, um, Starbucks, um, the, the restaurant in Atlanta right now that I think uh, Dominique Wilkins, Wilkins is complaining about, all of them shut down for a day for some aggressive diversity training. But what happens after that one day training? Right? It checks the box and then you move on. That's not change. That's not sustainable. And it doesn't work. We've seen it too many times. So my thought was, how do we make this uh, immersive enough? that it actually makes a difference for the faculty, which meant that we had to set, we had to give them a time window. So we have about six months where faculty participate uh, two Saturdays a month for about two hours each. In the first hour, they hear from guest speakers. Uh, and then the second hour, we're doing breakout activities and things that center different topics along the way. So we've had speakers like uh, Dr. Rua Benjamin, Dr. Sophia Noble, uh, Dr. Amy J. Cole, um, Gail Chapman, Joanna Good, a number of different people who speak on different topics around identity. Um, we'll, we'll finish with Cisco Ramos and Michael Betts uh, two Saturdays from now, um, who are also uh, associated with Duke. But the goal was to make sure that faculty are paying attention to these things in meaningful ways and engaging with a cohort of peers that allow them to learn in a safe space and share and reflect together. So one of the things we encouraged everyone to participate in teams because we didn't want anyone to have to come back to their home institution and be the sole knowledge, uh, knowledge bearer and person responsible for transferring all of that knowledge. We also encourage them to participate with graduate students because we recognize that a lot of graduate students are gonna fan out when they graduate and become faculty at other institutions. And so it was really important to make sure that 
uh, they had the ability to start to learn this while they're still in the learning process as well. Um, the other thing that we did, which was really intentional, was before this six month program of professional development starts, there's a prep packet of material that they had to complete from August to February. And that's a lot of books that we asked them to read so that everyone could enter the program in February with a baseline knowledge. So we didn't have to waste time trying to convince people of certain things or explain certain concepts. So books included uh, Race After Technology, uh, Thick by Tracy McMillan Cotton. I know that she was one of the speakers here. Uh, we, we also included The Privileged Poor by Anthony Jack. Um, we also had Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, a number of different books, specifically by uh, social scientists who understand this. Because the argument that I've always said is that the social scientists have been telling us this and the arrogance of our experience and expertise in computer science has not allowed us to hear it. And so this was a way that everyone for those first six to seven months, they have to do the reading and the work themselves. You can do it on your own pace, you can do an audio book, et cetera, but it's really important that you start to get this grounding of these topics so that when we move into those sessions, that you're not wasting anyone's time, including your own. And, we, and it's to ensure that everyone gets the most out of it. And so we're at session eight of 10 coming up in June. Um, to this point, we've had, we started with about 140 participants. We average uh, every session about 120 because some people have commitments. Uh, we record the sessions, but we've received really good feedback from participants. They come from everywhere around the world. So uh, there are institutions across the US, Canada, Austria, uh, and I believe Nigeria. And um, we're really excited because we only advertised within that same uh, computer science education listserv that I first talked about, but it's grown in popularity and uh, awareness over the last year. So we're really excited to see what happens with cohort two. We'll start applications for that in June. Um, but yeah, it's really a goal to kind of revolutionize how we teach computing because what we've been doing has only worked for a small group of people. And so if we really want to say that we want to address the issues of anti-racism and creating equitable and equal environments in computing, then we have to change how we're teaching computing because we're not making it inclusive of all students right now. Um, so yeah, so those are kind of the, the high level ways that we're looking to uh, impact change. One of the things that I also did around this time was reach out to the ABET accrediting body. Uh, the CSAP, Computer Science Accreditations Board, is the, the ABET arm that handles computing accreditation. And I emailed them and just said, I have this idea, and it was probably last February or March of, of how to uh, include uh, more culturally competent criteria into the requirements for programs and the general requirements. So how do I get that on the books? So how does that process work? And I remember I didn't get an email response quickly. So a couple of months later, I reached back out, I called whatever the number was on the website and whoever I spoke to immediately apologized and started to put me in contact with all of the different arms until I connected with the executive director of CSAT. And as a result, uh, I was told that, for example, that ABET was looking at how to incorporate more uh, criteria that related to DEI uh, into their program and general criteria. So would I be willing to serve on uh, the committee that helped to bring that to life for the computing arm? And I said, absolutely, because now it becomes a matter of policy. And that's how we start to address the system part, right? Um, because my in one of the papers that I wrote last year, um, when twice as good isn't enough, I kept saying that, you know, we can map it to current ABET criteria. But the problem is a lot of universities, specifically departments, will argue, well, we already have 120 credit hours. We can't make this work. And, and but, the pro but the one thing that always ensures that people will get it done is when ABET says you have to do it. And so my thought was, if I can get to the accrediting body, then everyone who wants ABET accreditation or wants to remain ABET accredited will have to make these changes. So I'm very grateful uh, to Donna Reese and Liz Glazer who have worked with me to kind of stay a part of that community because now it's not just impacting the people, it's impacting the policies as well. That's great. So I love how the, your own social movement is really 
affecting then further generations of computer scientists. Um, it may be asking too much of you, but um, is, isn't this something all faculty should be engaging in? Um, right, like the, clearly the three C's, it's cultural competence in computing, but maybe we all need two C's at least. Because uh, clearly, as you've described, these are issues that extend far beyond the tech space and computer science. Yeah, absolutely. I, and, and that is not lost on me, especially given the uh, shutdown STEM movement that happened over the summer, right? The Black and the Ivory hashtag that was trending on Twitter, where all of these Black faculty, staff, and students were talking about their experiences at PWIs. Um, so I agree. It should be something that is more of a 2C. The reason I centered computing was because um, one, that was my, my knowledge base. And two, I know how uh, pervasive computing is in every part of our lives. And we see every single day, the ways in which computing impacts uh, marginalized communities in ways that are moved from just harmful to life-threatening. And if we don't do something about it there, then we're in for a world of more problems because we are becoming more tech driven, more tech reliant. And if we don't have people in positions of development who look like me enough right now to say this is a problem, we need to, <coughs> excuse me, make sure that people who don't look like me are aware of these things as they're developing them and saying, wait a minute, we don't have anyone who's developing this who identifies as Black who identifies as transgender, who identifies as a person with disabilities. Have we thought about these things? And if not, we have to stop what we're doing right now. That's my goal. We have to make sure that until we can get more of people like me or people from the most minoritized into these positions, that everyone is thinking about it. Because if everyone starts thinking about that and developing cultural confidence, we'll see an influx of more people from minoritized communities. Because you can't just think about it in terms of the technology and not think about it in terms of the environment that you're in. Great. Um, I like how you brought those two together. So. Um... The audience is clamoring with questions. So uh, we didn't get to lots of things. I think we could talk all day here. Um, so let me just um, start with one of them. Um, do you have any suggestions on how people outside of academia can support folks like Professor Nicole Hannah-Jones, MacArthur Fellowship awardee, Pulitzer Prize winner for commentary for her work on the 1619 project, who was denied tenure at UNC. I'm sure you're familiar with the controversy here. I want to do something, and I'm not sure what will help and effectively draw attention and affect change. That's a good question. Um, a person who is not affiliated with higher ed, uh, first is using whatever voice you have to make that situation known. Right to make people aware of not only that it happened, but what it means. Right, people don't always understand tenure if they're not associated with higher ed, um, and also start to discuss the ways in which historically this has happened to Black women. And I say this because I don't know your identity, but I think it's very important for people in positions of privilege and power to have these discussions in their home environments around their social circles, with their family, and with their friends, and even at work. The casual conversations that happen um, when you're at lunch and someone just says something that's inappropriate and you kind of look up, but you don't say anything, but you know it's wrong, those are the ways in which you can start to uh, amplify these types of issues, to call attention to things. I think the biggest thing is you know, it's simply what Congressman John Lewis said, when you see something, say something, do something, right? Don't just sit quietly. Everyone has a platform, even if it's not in front of a camera, you have people who listen to you and trust you. Pour into your children and make sure that they understand these topics um, so that when they go to school, they don't have to deal with classmates or parents who are fighting things like critical race theory being taught, even though I'm not sure that's ever been taught at a K-12 level anyway, right? But your, your children come to school and understand that the way that history has been told is a revisionist history and the ways in which uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones has told our story in the 1619 Project 
is the true history of this country. Um, it doesn't take a background in higher ed to do those things. And I think that that's the most important piece is just use what, where you are and what you have to amplify these types of voices and arguments. We need it every single day, we see it. And encourage people to vote. I know that some people say voting doesn't matter, but we see what happens when we don't. And when we have people in positions of power who are using it to remain in positions of power. Great, here's, a, here's another question for you. Uh, where have you found mentors? And do you have suggestions for others who are underrepresented in our fields on how to find them? Oh, um, so for me, I have found mentors in many different places and they're not necessarily always in the tech space. Um, I was very fortunate to have a mom who was a computer programmer. So for me, uh, that helped tremendously. But outside of that, uh, there are people along the way who became informal mentors. There are people who I actually walked up to and said, I want you to mentor me. Um, and I think that it's really important for us to remember that all you have to do is ask a lot of times. Up until probably like two or three years ago, I'd never had a single person ask me to mentor them. Now, part of that I thought was like, when she asked, I, I thought, well, why would you want me to mentor you? I don't know anything. But then I kind of have to remember that there's this lived experience that I have that I can share, um, even if it's just common advice when she picks up a phone and calls and says, hey, I'm going through X, Y, Z. So I'd say also don't, don't be afraid to ask people. Uh, but when you ask them, make sure that you are intentional. It has to be uh, something that you are both going to invest in because you can ask someone to be your mentor and that can be the worst situation ever. Also, don't feel like it has to be someone who holds your identity. I've had uh, white men who have been great mentors for me. I talk about again, my advisor, uh, Harry Perils. I've had black women, I've had black men, I've had all people of different identities. And I think that's the part that we often um, don't pay attention to enough is that I, someone doesn't have to hold my identity to understand my experience. Now it helps because there's a lived experience we share, but uh, there's so many other people from minoritized communities who understand in different ways and can, and you both can learn from each other. And that's the thing, like a mentoring relationship should really be mutually beneficial for both of you. Um, so that would be my advice. And, and like I said, don't be afraid to reach out and contact people and ask them, right? The worst they can say is no. And you'd be surprised, a lot of people will say, sure. Um, if you're in computing, I'd say that, for example, uh, the Black Computer Group has a great fellows program and community for Black women in computing. Uh, that's Black Compute and then her H-E-R. Um, so that's one way, uh, but also leaning into those organizations, for example, uh, on your campus or uh, I, I look. I enjoy looking forward to uh, attending things like the Black Think Tank events here at Duke because it allows me to engage with Black faculty that I wouldn't always necessarily. Um, but yeah, th there are a number of ways that you can reach out. They don't have to look like you and they definitely don't have to be in your field to understand. I get so much more from engaging with people outside of computing than I do uh, within. Super. Um, next up, um, and they're flying in. Um, so what... Oops too fast for me to even track here. Uh, what remediation, if any, do you think will be needed for students who studied computer science virtually this year? Do you think the pandemic learning experience will give them an edge at all? I know we talked a little bit about your experience teaching this year before we got on. Yeah, I think the short answer to that is, what do you mean by edge? Because um, I, I think that a lot of people struggle to get through this semester. And I don't, I don't know if any student has an edge. Um, I think if anything, what we learned was that uh, remote learning as we've seen it, it does not work for a large number of students for a number of what reasons, right? Um, be it your class, uh, be it your home environment, whatever it is. Um, I struggled this semester. So I don't, I don't feel like I got any kind of edge. In fact, I feel like this is probably one of my worst uh, experiences teaching, but I think because, you know, I just kind of was the most honest, like, look, I'm just struggling every day to wake up. So, you know, if we're going to get through this together, I think students appreciated that honesty. So 
I, I, I can't say that there's any edge. I think that what we need to consider is the fact that we probably should extend grace to a lot of students and recognize that the fall semester is not gonna look like a typical fall semester. If we have to be back on campus, whatever it is, we need to plan for the fact that every student was not able to thrive. Um, a lot of students were simply just trying to wake up every day and find a working internet connection and not pull their hair out, especially with everything else that was happening in this world. Um, and we need to offer grace and not have the expectation that they should be ready to hit the ground running come August. Great, I really appreciate that um, notion of offering grace. Um, next question. You've mentioned examples of interpersonal interactions which lead to exclusion. Are there changes that need to be made uh, to CS course content, uh, i.e. what sort of projects are assigned to promote greater inclusion? So really looking at the curricular dimensions of what happens in a CS class. Um, the short answer for that is you're gonna have to try to find ways to include more historical context in every single computing course. Um, instead of just talking about ones and zeros and loops, Etc. We need to be talking about uh, the ways in which uh, historically, uh, for example, fintech applications are excluding communities of color, especially black communities, when what we define as credit is not necessarily what a lot of black communities have and trace that back to redlining, etc. Um, and black codes and sharecropping, for example, I, I think that those are the kinds of conversations that need to be had. And that requires one, faculty who are willing to learn more and then willing to incorporate it. But if you're really doing your job as a faculty member, you're not resting solely on the fact that you're, re you're, you're repeating everything you've done every semester. You're looking to try to find ways to be better. And when you have mandates, for example, from university presidents like we have at Duke uh, around creating more inclusive spaces, then that should be a priority. Um, it's easy to do what you've done and there was an argument before that, you know, efficiency, you lose efficiency. I think one of my students said this in a project. Um, you lose efficiency in doing things that are inclusive. So you don't have the fastest. Um, it takes a little bit longer to create that space, but it's so much more effective and important because you are making sure that you are thinking and doing for everyone. And that's how we have to think about it as faculty. It's extra work, yes. But uh, are we worried about the extra work in creating it or the long-term gains once you've got it done and up and working for everyone? So how do you, um, in, in doing that work with faculty, how do you address the, the frequent faculty refrain, which is, I don't know how, right? It's not my area of expertise. I haven't done that learning um, and, and feeling really insecure in doing that. Uh, I tell them first and foremost, there is a program called the Cultural Competence and Computing Fellows Program that three Black women created. And so if you're asking me how to do something, then I'm going to point you right there because we've done that and uh, it helps you create that comfort. Um, the next thing I would say is if you've done that or you're doing it, then you need to get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Uh, there's this I think that for people who have never been in these positions of discomfort, they, they feel like that um, I don't know what to do and I don't know how to be. Um, but I tell them all the time, like, I don't know how to exist in a world where I'm comfortable. When I step outside of my home, like I am constantly in a state of discomfort in some way. And that it doesn't matter how many degrees I have, what job I have, et cetera. I am just as easily targeted by all of the things that are happening in society um, as anyone else. And so if you feel uncomfortable learning these things or don't know what to do, think about those one or two students who are um, who have disabilities, who are from low socioeconomic classes, who are black or indigenous, who are transgender, right? What are they experiencing and going through? And if you can't be discomforted enough to make it better for them, then I'd say you probably need to reconsider why you're even in education. Great, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, we are actually at the end of this, this conversation. The time has just flown by. Um, two questions that, that I wanted to get out there that are super quick are first, are the three C sessions and information available publicly or do you have to be part of the program? And then second, When's the next call for participants coming out? Because I think lots of folks would uh, clearly like to participate. 
Yeah, so the first is yes, um, and that's to protect uh, the safe space for all participants. Um, the solicitation for cohort two will go out in June. Uh, applications will start then through July for the cohort two, which will begin in August. That will be posted on the identity uh, workshop. I'm sorry website, the identity website. So um, if there's a link, if someone can share that, just that fellow's web page, it'll all be there. Um, and if you don't have that, you can find it easily off the cs.duke.edu slash tilde Nikki. Um, and all of that information is linked off of my website as well, my Duke website. Great. And just a final question, as you look to this coming year, uh, what are you personally most hopeful about? Uh, I am hopeful about the fact that for once, uh, computing and uh, institutions in general, especially PWIs, predominantly white institutions, are finally acknowledging that white supremacy and racism are a thing and that black people and brown people no longer have to be the only people uh, fighting and saying that these things happen and being gaslit and told that it's not. So uh, I, I look forward to actually people doing more than just reading and uh, tweeting about it. Great. Uh, this is just a fabulous way to end the series. Um, thank you so much, right, both for this conversation and your extraordinary leadership in this space. We are so lucky here at Duke uh, to have you as part of our community. So thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, and just a final thanks to the Kern Family Foundation for supporting the series. Um, and hope you get a little bit of rest at least this summer. Yes, a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.